I'm John Nicholl. I joined the Royal Air Force in 1981, and as a young 18-year-old serviceman, remember watching the 1982 Falklands War unfold on my TV screens. Like many at that time, I wondered what it would be like to go to war for real. For the men who fought in the South Atlantic campaign, they found out all too soon what the reality of battle actually meant. Towards the end of the conflict, three para were tasked to attack Mount Longdon as part of the final push towards Port Stanley and eventual victory. I'm joined today by some of the survivors of that assault, a brutal battle which would claim the lives of 23 of their friends and colleagues. Tony Wardby was a section commander in A Company. Tam Noble also commanded a section within the same company. Mike Southall was in B Company, alongside John Ross, who was five platoon sergeant, and Lance Corporal Len Carver. For the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. So the 20, 21st of May, you land at uh, San Carlos. Tony, was it as you imagined, uh, an opposed landing, an unopposed landing? What was it actually like going in? Well, it was, it, it was surreal. We, we were late. Uh, I think something happened with two para, because they had to go down scramble nets, I believe, or something. We were easy, because we were in the back of these uh, ships, uh, where you just go out with the landing craft. So we... we uh, exited the back of the boat and what I can remember was it was like a mill pond and then suddenly I noticed on Fanning Head was getting uh, uh, rounds on it artillery and uh, that was getting taken out I believe by the special forces I think or whoever was doing that and it was it was just so weird. It sounds almost like a scene from a film you know the the rounds going in yes. well, I mean Tam you it was unopposed but it could have been chaos in actual fact. Yes, yes. As, uh, as we approached the beach we then found out the depth of the water okay for the soldiers to disembark from the ship was too deep so we then had to do a bit of, a bit of pepper potting with the other boats but we made it work so we hit the landing point and went from there into the sea pod. And so you're dug in on San Carlos uh, of course San Carlos water known as Bomb Alley then and now and the, the Argentines were coming in and attacking the ships in San Carlos water in, 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 the, in Bomb Alley. Len, did you see that? Did you see what was happening there? Yeah, I was, um, my position was dug up on top of Windy Gap and um, digging in, you could actually see the Argentine um, aircraft and they were level with us coming down the valley. And the first time they come down, everybody up the fire on them from three power, two power on the other side. And, and in the end, they had, to say, they had to check fire on us because the problem being rounds were landing on each of us. We couldn't hit an aircraft at that speed, but we all wanted to have a go at it. Um, but you was watching go, and surreal as it is, at one stage, two aircraft came down and watched them, and the pilots were, all right, boys. And they were actually waving to us as they were coming down Bomb Alley, mm. down to t have a go at the ships. Your memories of that time? Well, I had a grandstand view. Where we landed, my trench, was in a gorse bush. My task was to cover, uh, I think they used that big open area where we landed as a, an airstrip, put a lot of aircraft in. So I was looking basically at all the ships and these, these pilots, brave pilots coming in at zero feet, uh, dropping their bombs and, and, and watching them, some of them just getting blown to pieces because they got the rapiers going. Uh, at first I thought they were firing some like, form of airburst and what it was, it was the jet disintegrating with one of these uh, missiles hit them. And, and I mean, it, pre presumably this is a real eye-opening vision of what war is going to be like. Yeah, yeah. You're sitting there and you're thinking, by that time, the focus changed. You're now in it and you're doing all your drills, stagging on, patrols were going out. I mean, on the first night, I went out on a standing patrol for 15 hours, sitting in a gorse bush, watching an inlet that the OC thought might be a soft area. So all this was going on. And you've got the normal admin, 
So and, and are you being attacked at this point, Mick? Is there any mortars coming in or, or we shells? Were in a, our, our position, I was actually in the lens section, our position wasn't on direct fire. It was just that the aircraft were ignoring us, of course, and going straight for the ships. So obviously for the supply line, and they, probably, they maybe even thought some of our soldiers were still on those ships. And they, um, they were just sometimes below us, as Len said, sometimes level with us. Okay, and they just kept coming past. It was the air raid warning red. And I, fact, I, I also remember at the time, um, it, it was air raid warning red for so many times that people even started to go, oh, not again. And even started to relax, even when it was air raid warning red. Um, but as soon as the um, artillery guys, or I think was, the RAF got the rapier going and started taking the aircraft out, yeah, this, we, we were, had a grandstand view, as Tony said, of a battle that, although it didn't involve us, was going on. We had a grandstand view of it, the aircraft versus the ships. Um, of course, one of the things that happened was Atlantic Conveyor was sunk, and the helicopters, I think, that were meant to be transporting you guys Eventually. halfway across the island, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they went down. And yeah. so you did what all good paras have to do. Yep. You walked. We yeah. uh, we tabbed. tabbed. Sorry, we, we, in we the Air Force, we, we, we don't walk. We, we, uh, we, we get a bus or something yeah. like that. Marine, Marines, you on Paris tabs, so like a, a quicker version of you on. And a tab, yeah. I think it was 80, is it 80 miles or something like that that you had to, to, uh, to go forward? Um, I think as a crew flew, it was about 80 miles, but we, we made a lot of diversions on the way. Um, but th th that was normal for us. We, we started walking and we were happier. We were sitting in defence in St. Carlos. That, that's not the parachute regiment way. Mm. We're never happy in a defensive position. And we'd been sitting there for a few days. So we were actually relieved when we actually got the kit on their back and started to move. Uh, and we were moving then. You know, uh, as we uh, thought, we, we went various objectives on the way. And it was, in many uh, ways, an advance to contact. And we were always looking to contact the enemy um, on the way. And we, we mopped up a, a couple of minor positions on the way until we got uh, about eight miles away from Mount Longdon. And we stayed there for a few days preparing for the attack. And so, uh, over the course of the, the tab, Tam, what, what, what are you carrying? What, are you, you know, what sort of weight are you carrying? What gear are you well, carrying? Well, the, the basic, well, the gear that they had to carry was because obviously they'd lost the helicopters was webbing only and weapons, that was it. So most of your weight was carried on that kit. Was, I would say up to 100 pounds guys were carrying. So you had uh, 66 millimeter, machine guns, uh, you, were, you were full in ammunition, if not even more. Uh, extra grenades, all of it had to go. There was no bargains on its way. So that was it, push forward, push to Theo and let, and that brought the best out in the eye because it was fit to fight. That's where it showed on the boys, and that's what they were good at, was tabbing, especially three para. Tactical advance to battle. By the time they reached the start line, the men of three para were aware that in the midst of appalling weather, they would face 800 highly trained and well dug in Argentinians. B Company was tasked with taking two summits, codenamed Fly Half and Full Back. A Company would take Wing Forward. C Company would be held in reserve. You say your last goodbyes on the start line to each other. Yeah, I'll see you the other side, mate. But you know that somewhere in that time that you're going to lose someone. And those moments, you know, sort of as midnight approaches, as the start time approaches, uh, Tony, uh, any time for personal thoughts, or are you, are you ready now? No, no personal thoughts. I'm thinking about what we're going to do, and the responsibility I've got for the, the section and my platoon, and knew it was going to be a, a fight. Uh, I, I just was just thinking about the battle drills, making sure the blokes were focused on what they had to do. Um, and, and that was it, it really just and the fear knowing that I'm going to go and do it now. This is what we train for. Got to go and do it. The battle for Mount Longdon began when three para left their start line on the 12th of June 1982. The plan was for a silent approach. As we, we set off and um, we could see the silhouette of Mount Longdon in front of us, um, we, we knew this was, was a real thing. You know, it was a completely different atmosphere. The, the guys were up. I, I was in my position, um, centre rear of the platoon. The young lads were in front. And as we approached Mount Longdon, um, one of the guys in four platoon, Brian Milne, stepped in an anti-personnel mine. 
that alerted the Argentinians. They, they, they weren't fully stood to, which gave us an advantage. And we had questioned the, the sense of a silent night attack. Um, it wasn't something we'd ever trained to do. You know, it, was, it, was, uh, it was different, but there was reasons for it. We didn't have enough artillery to support every attack in Indo London. There was reasons for it, and I firmly believe to this day that the command officer's decision to do that actually saved lives. And although Bran walked in the mine, we were close enough to London at that stage, certainly my platoon, five platoon, to advance very quickly and get in amongst the rocks and get in amongst the enemy. And are there rounds coming down straight away, Tony? Can you build a picture? Can you describe the scene for me? Hell. Absolutely horrendous. I think everybody on that hill was firing at me. That's, the f that's what it felt like. I, I can't, the, the rounds ammunition being fired was unbelievable. The tracer, uh, they were putting up uh, illumination shells that were making weird noises. I think it was from the cases that were falling. Um, and uh, bullets everywhere, near. We, we, I know what close is. I know what it very close is, and it was all of those. You could see the peat all being uh, with the rounds hitting the peat, all straight, and it's all around you. Absolutely horrendous. And I mean, if you're running through that, do you, do you pause? I mean, do you pause for thought? Um, I don't mean no. literally pause for thought, but well, if the rounds are all around you, I'm trying to imagine how you get out of it. Well, the, we didn't. We got, uh, we got the order to take cover and we stopped. Um, we went to ground and there was hardly any cover. There was a little peat banks where you get the peat drops and managed to get my section along one of the gullies, but it wasn't really affordable cover, proper cover, because remember they're firing down on us. And of course, we, we tab across the island and we get mist, rain, snow. In the night we attack, it was a crystal clear night with the biggest moon I've seen in the, and we were just silhouetted, they could see us. Len, your first images of the opening minutes of the contact? As Brian stood on the mine, we heard the mine go off, then Brian screaming. The two lads, I was a gun team commander, I was a Lance Corporal with two lads uh, with a GPMG heavy machine gun. and. Uh, when that kicked off, I just said to the two, follow me, we're going up this rock run. Stay behind me. If I go bang, you know it's safe then, carry on. Um, and we just went up this, and, and if you imagine, it's just a long run of rocks. And we were just bouncing from rock to rock, going up, up into, and it was a steep climb. It wasn't, it wasn't a flat surface, it wasn't a flat field, it was a climb into a mountain. And we just went up through until we got into the large rocks. We could hear, um, Obviously, the gunfire going off, machine guns opening up. We could hear the Argentinian shouting in Spanish. You know, and all I thought was was just to get up, get into cover, because we were actually out in the open uh, when it happened. So I just wanted to get myself and the two lads up out to the open ground. Tam, those opening few moments from your perspective, what are you seeing? Well, I was a section commander, two section A company, and we were on the left hand side of the B company, and our objective was wing forward, which was a spur just to the northeast side. Uh, and I believe there were three minefields there as well, but as a section commander, there was an initial, on the initial compromise, which was obviously Brian's step on the mine, as uh, Tony just described there, it was just unbelievable. But as a section commander, that is where your training kicks in, okay, to get your men going forward. But we were in dead ground, uh, slight dead ground from, from direct fire, so we used the folds in the ground as best we could to keep as low as we can until we receive further orders. But at that time, B Company were well in the thick of it, uh, they were taking most of the fire in the depth position where they were and it was now for A Company to establish a new plan. But yes, for the section commander side of things, that for me, that's the, uh, going to war. So John, in B Company, you're in the heart of it as Tam describes. What, what, what are you experiencing? What is it like for you to be in the heart of that battle? Well, five platoon, we were actually point platoon of B Company, so we were right at, at the front. Um, as the, the guys have said, we became fragmented slightly because the, the natural thing as soon as the, in the drill, as soon as you come under fire, and we'd never ever been under the intense fire that we were under at this stage, was for the guys to get down and get into cover. My job at that point then was to try and get the platoon together again and, and start consolidating. Um, I was aware of Lenny and the guys up the front um, and uh, Corporal Eaton's section, 
Um, and we could see uh, and knew exactly, listening to the radio, the fight that was going on. And we were fairly close. It was only 20, 30 metres maybe at, at most. When you say you can see, what can you see? What is the image that you can see when you say, I can see the fighting going on? The image was that um, at one particular, there was a 50 calibre machine gun post manned by Argentinians. And the guys had to take that out. And that was one of the guns that was putting severe fire down on the A company. Um, we didn't have anything of that calibre. Um, we learnt and we got them afterwards, but we didn't have weapons of that calibre. So just the sound of a 50 calibre firing, you know, the thud, thud, thud of it, in conjunction with all the other firing that was going on, it, it was pretty ferocious. So I was aware and watching these guys um, assault and take out the first gun position. As we were moving up towards them, I'd started gathering up um, the, the platoon and with some support company guys with us. And the first Argentinians that I encountered were actually behind, slightly behind in the right to us. They, they were confused, obviously, because we'd got into their position before they, they um, were alerted. And they spoke to us, you know, and there's many, there's many stories about the Argentinians taunted us or whatever. Um, but my own view was that they didn't know who was there. They were confused. And they, they shouted at us from the top of the rocks. And of course, they were answered by gunfire. And then I, I, we talked about the, the 50 cal. I think you were part of the, the team that actually took out one of those guns. Again, heavily defended. Can you describe the action? I mean, I, I've used an SLR on the range before, uh, but never in close combat. It must have been an, 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 an amazing experience. Yeah, uh, it, basically the, the three of us, as I said earlier on, uh, got it met up with Corporal Heaton. And if you imagine a, a st quite a steep rock face down, slab of rock and they were leaning against there was uh, Corporal Heaton and a couple of other lads and I joined up with him and we, we started to have a conflap and then I looked up and I could see this thing sticking to the sky and we thought it was a radio aerial, uh, a big tube and then an aerial on top but then all of a sudden it dropped and then it opened fire down towards A Company we knew then it was a 0.5 calibre. Um, you could, where we were, we were literally 15 foot below it and you could feel the vibration from, from the rounds as they were leaving the barrel you know, and that sound, boom, 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 boom. So basically what I did, I, I grabbed three lads and said, right, we're going to take this out. Me and so-and-so are going up here on the right. You two go to um, uh, Ben Goff and Dominic Gray. You two go to the left. We'll lob grenades in and fire into them. You clear the trench. That's my job as, that's my job as, a, as a, uh, a Lance Corporal to do, is to lead the guys. So I went up, we opened fire, dropped through grenades at them. Problem being was the grenades bounced off and rolled down the hill. So Graham Meaton obviously had to take cover down there. But, but the two lads went in assaulted. There was three Argentinians in there. Um, the three of them were dispatched, we, were killed in the assault. Um, we then... Is this now hand-to-hand -hand fighting, Len? Are you, I mean, you've got your bayonets fixed. Or are you you're bayonets. shooting from a distance? No, this, this is from... We, we opened fire, myself and the other t lad that was with me, we opened fire from about six, seven foot at the trench. While the, then the other... As, and it, it, it all happens at one go. So it was on like a count of three, standby, two, three, bang, 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 into the trench. And then the, the other two lads then come steaming in, bawling and shouting, and firing from the hip into the trench. Um, they jumped, they actually jumped into the trench. The Argentinians in there were killed. Um, gun was captured. So we took that out, you know, gave A Company a bit of respite, just, well, from one. Point five at least. Tony, I mean, you're coming under mortar fire uh, almost constantly, and I think you had a, a lucky escape, didn't you? Yeah, uh, the, uh, let's say, this fire continued, and we were, as, as Tom says, we were just taking cover best we could. Uh, I then got mortared, uh, my section, and uh, the, I heard this horrendous noise, never experienced before. When I looked behind me, it, it's a uh, mortar round has landed about two feet from the back of my legs, hit the, the peat and not gone off. And then instantly later, as more mortars land, uh, my end, my machine gun, got, uh, machine gun bloke got hit and I, he started screaming. So I've run across to where he was, uh, found out he was the machine gunner. Obviously, now as a section commander, I've got to command and change things because I need the gun. Get that swapped onto somebody else, take all the ammunition off him because he's got belted ammunition that we needed. Uh, medic appeared and he, he was um, 
taken away. And is there constant fire coming yeah. in around all of this? This all isn't all this. happening in slow, casual no, time. No, it's just ammunition being fired at tracer. The ground is rounds hitting the ground. Uh, and then I, I went back into position, reorganised it. Um, and what I can remember, like Tam says, we were told to move around to the right. But that little phase, what I was in, we, it's most frustrating because we couldn't get forward and get, get into the, the hill. I had a grandstand view of, of B Company. Um, one that sticks in my mind is two, two machine guns firing at each other. I could tell the, the, the B Company one because of its distinctive uh, sh short bursts as we are taught. And the, the, the Argentinian GPMG was long, like long slow bursts. Uh, and I could see them in the rocks. I mean, we weren't firing because I was aware that B Company had started uh, attacking the hill. So we, we just had to sit there and taking the sustained heavy fire um, until we were told to move around and then we, we start to move. And Mick, you're in the, the midst of this. You talked earlier about the fact that you've done all the training, you've done all the drills, you've done the rehearsals. What was the reality like for you? The reality of it was the training kicked in. It's the truth, the training kicked in. Everyone became a link man. We could see the fighting going on be because of the flashes in the rocks. We could hear the noise of, our Argenti of the Argentinians shouting. I could hear the noise of our own commanders shouting. Everyone was a link man, everyone was shouting. Because of the terrain, you couldn't rely on one person to pass measures. So everyone was shouting. I just remember the shouting, the screaming. I found myself um, with uh, my section commander and another section and of course uh, Corporal McLaughlin, okay, on the left-hand side of, of the rocks that John was on the other side with Corporal Eaton, etc. And we found ourselves down there in what became, became known as Grenade Alley, uh, where they were dropping grenades on us from the top. Um, we moved through and we, every, the, the two corporals got everything together and then we found ourselves at a rock and they, once somebody told me to go to the, the left-hand side of the rock, so I did. And, and I peered round and I said, there's someone there. So somebody turned around and said, well, effing shoot him. So I went round, he was no further than five or six feet away from me and I put about five or six rounds into him and then came back and then somebody said, is he still there? I said, well, he may well be, but he's no longer a threat or that might not be in the words I used. And when we went round, there he was on the floor. But that's the reality of that's that reality. sort of reality. Unfortunately, I was quicker than him. The men of 3 Paro were making progress on Mount Longdon, but it was a long, hard, cold fight. For the British, it would turn out to be the costliest land battle of the whole campaign. We pushed forward as far as, far as we, we could get, and we were coming under against a wall of fire. Uh, it was a wall of fire. It would have been suicide to keep pushing forward any further. And it was, in fact, that was the furthest point that B Company got that night before A Company came round the back. I was very aware um, through radio chatter and uh, talking to the guys and the link men of what was going on down to the left where Ian Mackay and Ford platoon were and uh, part of my platoon with Corporal McLaughlin and I was aware of what 6 platoon were going through up to the right. They, they were suffering uh, a lot of casualties as well. We could actually see the Argentinian positions that were firing at 6 platoon. I turned uh, some of the guns onto those positions but six platoon were right in amongst them, so they could immediately come back to stop because we were, were putting them in danger. And they were in exactly the same position that we were in. They were in very close and personal with the Argentinian positions. And it really was, as Mick says, you came around a rock, there was a guy there, he had to be taken out. Um, they were coming round, there was bunkers, you were coming through the rocks or climbing over the boulders, you were coming across another position. That position had to be taken out and we just continued to push up. During that battle, there, there was no quarter asked, no quarter given. It, it was a very, very close and personal fight. And you mentioned uh, Sergeant I uh, Ian Mackay. Um, his heroism, of course, <coughs> is, is, actually, is legend within the regiment and the battalion. Then I think you were part of the action. Can you describe what you know happened that night? Basically, that there was a, a trench position um, which was holding everybody up and Ian went forward with some of his lads. A um, couple of them were wounded and, and dropped, Ian carried on and uh, his body was found slumped over the, the trench position. 
And Mick, did you see Sergeant Mackay's body as well? Were you? I was you... mixed it with, with with four platoon and five platoon uh, under the command of uh, Scouts McLaughlin, who was just amazing, to be honest. Um, after the four platoon had already done, mounted one assault, and they decided to do a recce to see if they could mount another one. Uh, the platoon commander got hit, and, and it was up to Sergeant Mackay to take over. Sergeant Mackay was actually my training sergeant in the depot as well. Um, after the assault went in, he took two, he grabbed whoever was nearest to him, okay? Uh, he, he went on to the assault because of the feature that nobody, we didn't actually see the assault, okay? Well, I can remember his um, scouts from Glockland telling us to fire into likely enemy positions or where we could see the flash. Immediately after the, the sort of chaos stopped, um, a very good friend of mine called John Lewis, okay? Typical paratrooper, young NCO, right, get up, we've got to do something. And he just grabbed me. We went round to the rocks, okay, and we found um, two or three injured personnel, okay. Uh, we left one person, uh, uh, Sully Aladji, okay, to, to treat them, and myself and John, or John grabbed me, okay, to go forward, and uh, John confirmed and found where Ian Mackay was. Um, I was just kneeling down, sort of, he was saying, is it him? And, and I went, well, I, th I think so, you know, I don't know, okay, and it was. Uh, and then we started to get in, get, we got engaged then because the Argentinians could then see us. And um, all I can remember is that Sergeant Mackay was dead on the position. Um, and you have no time to stop to reflect on that, of course. You, you no, know, you've got a battle to fight. Even though it was my opportunity sergeant in the depot and he was a great sergeant. OK, um, no, I didn't. I was upset. I was because he was a, my opportunity sergeant, but no, I didn't have time because, to be honest, you haven't got time to think. You just have to get on with it. Afterwards, then you come a little bit more reflective, I suppose. And of course, he was awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross uh, for, his, for his incredible courage. But of course, the casualties are growing. And one of your friends, Neil Gross, I think it was, yep. uh, uh, is sorry. hit. Yeah, after, after the assault by uh, Ian Mackay and we came round, back round the rocks, um, the most pivotal voice I remember is Court McLaughlin shouting orders, commands, etc., making sure everyone's OK, getting everyone together. And where the, the command came from, I, I have no idea. but. He then started saying, right, get our guys. There was a lot of guys from 4 platoon Indian and 5 platoon. Go and get our guys, get them back now. So everyone sort of ditched whatever they could. And we went out into the, back down the mountain to find out, find these people in the, um, in the grass and the rocks. And unfortunately, I found myself next to a guy called Neil Gross, who I uh, joined the army with. Um, he's been very, very badly injured. Not just me, there was lots of people around him trying to help. But the young man was in an awful lot of pain. And um, we got him onto, the, onto a poncho. And, but unfortunately for him, he wouldn't lay still, okay, because he was so badly injured. Um, we did as best we could. We got him back to the um, regimental aid post. And um, there was one person at his head, and I was at his feet. The medic, uh, Phil Probers, was trying everything he could. Um, and Neil was in an awful amount of distress. And then all of a sudden, it went quiet. And uh, that's when he went. And of course, these are your really close mates. These were, yeah. You know, the, the, what you were the, the young the lads that him. you joined up with. I joined him. the army with him in 1980. Uh, there was three from our intake in 1980 that were actually killed. All under. Neil was 18 on the day. The other two were actually under 18. It was his birthday that day, wasn't it? It was his birthday that day, yeah. It was just fate or bad luck that I found myself actually next to him. And as a, a young man, is that, is that picture, that image of Neil, is that still with you? Yes, you can see. Very much. Tam, um, the weather conditions. We, we know that the Falklands can be changeable in their weather conditions. What was it like that night as you're getting ready to take up the next part of the attack? What can you see of the mountain? Well, no, the attack is, under, the attack is now fully blown. Complete compromise. Uh, it was, there was smoke, there was a, a mist in the ground as well, which did not allow you to obviously use your IWSs or your night surveillance to be very difficult. Uh, the terrain was just difficult, as we explained before by, uh, by John. But uh, as we moved up there, you've got to remember when A Company was told to move to the right, we still had to move through minefields as well uh, in that difficult weather. It was, there was a frost on the ground as well, which was a godsend for us because when, when we got to the minefields, we actually used our footprint and just say, follow me, my soldiers would this follow me. This isn't a field, this is peat bog, peat you're, bog, you're sinking into frozen, your ankles. Frozen peat bog through a minefield, 
you would walk it. We took the same route in which uh, Copper Milne uh, stepped on a mine. We followed that route through, all the platoons. But you would ask your soldiers behind you, step into your footprint as we led through into the back of Longden. And then that's when we pushed through, where we then found the chaos. B Company reorganising themselves, sorting prisoners out, sorting casualties out, pushing them back to the RAP as well. A lot going on, a lot of swapping smocks, swapping rank as well. And then that's when A Company then pushed itself up onto the ball. The three platoons then got established. And so, Tony, as you're moving around you're through a minefield now, you would have engineers guiding you through a minefield. You just wouldn't run through a minefield. But back then, that's what you had to do. No, we had to get up to the rocks. And I said, same as Tom, I just said to the blokes, try and step them. By the way, you're under fire. I mean, it, it's just crazy what you do, but you have to do it. That's the job. So he just said to the bloke, step, make sure you step in a man's feet in front of you. Uh, and if I blow up, make sure you take the radio and keep moving up into the rocks. But we had to get up into the rocks where B Company was. That was priority. And are you under fire as you're moving forward? Oh, yes, yeah, so com yeah, complete fire on both positions. What, what, what is complete fire? What is, what's happening point to Point 0.5 browning, uh, machine guns onto you. Uh, they were also bringing in 155 artillery started to come in later that, later that morning. So there was a lot going on, a lot of chaos as well. So the guys trying to reorganise themselves. The chaos was, and I think what struck home for the soldiers was, was seeing the condition of B Company. They've now been fighting five, six hours, hard fighting. Uh, a Company pushed through those soldiers as well. And as, as you're moving forward, are you now encountering those heavily defended Argentinian positions as well? I, we, we started encountering on one incident where I was trying to get through some rocks and I was aware of a section commander from B Company. The lads, I could hear them shouting, lobbed a grenade or fired a 66. I'd gone along this, tried to make go through this little gully with my blokes behind us. And as they came up, there was this almighty fire. There must have been an Argentinian just on the left in a, a little hole and hit uh, the section commander. The NCO, it was in a little other gully. I remember pulling the blokes through and I was completely, I've never felt so helped, I couldn't move because the fire was literally, if I'd gone left, I would have got probably all the rounds in my chest. I mean, the, you've all used the word chaotic, chaos. You, you've all, you know, you've done those sections attack on Salisbury Plain, you've, you've attacked the bridges. How different was it, John, in the prosecution of what you were doing? It, it was a corporal's war, it was a section war. And when I described chaos, the command structure was getting taken out. By the next morning after the battle, then he was one of my corporals. I had one corporal left. When we went into the battle, I started with eight. But really what, what happened in the battle and the chaos, it was chaotic with B Company, but what we'd done, we'd secured a foothold. We'd secured a foothold on the hill. We'd formed more or less a demarcation line between ourselves and the Argentinian positions. And A Company could then come through and, um, you know. At great much, cost, of course. At great cost, yeah. We'd, we'd lost a lot of guys at that stage. Three Para had faced 800 or so well dug in Argentinians backed up by artillery. Enemy defences were crumbling, but there were still pockets of resistance in the rocky terrain. As B Company manoeuvred along a sheep track, they walked into an ambush. We shake out um, in single file because the sheep track is, is narrow. If you imagine a steep rock up to our right and then it falls away to the left. Um, we come out from the rocks, the two lads in front are leading. Um, I'm about fourth in line, there's a guy in front of me. And as we come down, um, literally about 25, 30 feet in front of us, there's a big rock and there's a gap between the rock on its own. Sheep track goes between that and, and the rock face. And an Argentinian soldier stands up um, and he actually says, hey, hombre. And he just, from the hip, lets fly a full magazine. Bearing in mind, they've got automatic weapons, ours were single shot. The two lads in front split, take cover. The lad, unfortunately, in front of me was killed. Um, he took quite a few rounds. Um, I was diving for cover and I got hit. 
Uh, the round went through my side, through my left lung, hit the front ribs and bounced back out again through my back. Um, I ended up rolling down into this open patch and then the next thing I know, up in the rocks above, there's two or three Argentinians who then start shooting down into me. Classic ambush zone. Uh, I'm in the kill zone. I start return fire back at them and then all of a sudden the blood comes pouring out my nose, out my mouth. My lungs collapsed, um, so I just then lay there, put my head in my hands and think, hey Hope, here we go. Like, you know, I had rounds landing between me, I had one go between my elbow and my head. Um, and the next thing then, the two lads that I'd basically tabbed across the island with, come out from cover, brought themselves into the kill zone, grabbed me and dragged me into, into cover. Saved so, your life. Yeah, definitely. I, I, if I'd have been there any more time in there, it, to, when you're lying there and you're in pain, there's blood coming out your nose, coming out your mouth, it seems like it's taken hours. It really did. It, I just lay there. But they said it, it was a matter of seconds that once, once I'd been hit, because this, this round hit me, it knocked me back six, seven foot. And, and then I rolled down into this open area and it, it, I was probably there 10, 15 seconds at the most. I could hear people shouting down to me, you, you hit, and I was just, I was burbling because I couldn't, couldn't talk because of the blood coming out of my throat, like, yeah, so. Um, but they came down and dragged me in. And did, I mean, uh, you know, did you expect to die? Because I've been in a, a similar position where I expected to die and found it actually quite a calming experience in actual fact. I was calm, yeah. Like I said, I just put my head into my arms. I'd gone like this and I just lay there and I thought, yeah, see ya. There's nothing that you can do, is there? There was nothing I couldn't do. I couldn't move. I, I was, it was just rounds bouncing all around me. It, to give someone an idea of it, um, Saving Private Ryan, if you watch the opening scene, the landing on the beach, don't watch the scene, close your eyes and just listen to the rounds coming in. That is what it was like. That, that's, that noise of a round going over your head, landing, hitting the ground in front of you. Um, the next thing is then I, I come round again um, and nine squadron power engineers and the cooks um, had come up the hill with stretchers, carrying ammunition, dropped that off and they were to taking the wounded down to the aid post. Uh, they'd come up with two stretchers, there was three of us, two, two were legs and myself. Um, the medic prioritised, said right, Len goes on a stretcher, Graham on a stretcher, Frank will have to stay here. And I, was, I said no, no, I said to the nine squadron, I said you help me down, I'll walk down. And it was one of the most painful episodes of my life I will say. Um, but the two lads got taken down the stretch, I'm walking behind, and as we're walking down, artillery fire comes in. And with that, the nine squadron lad throws me on the floor, and I was bigger than him, but he still managed to, he wrapped himself around me to protect me. And the round landed about 15 foot from us. Luckily the ground, where it hit, didn't hit the rocks, it hit a soft patch in between the rocks. So all the explosion went up in the air, but it, it was, the, the vibration from it, it was just, and I just thought, I've survived getting shot, I'm gonna get blown up now. These sods are definitely after me, like, yeah. But you had a lucky escape. Lucky, yeah, yeah. Yeah, someone was looking after me. Uh, Tam, you know, the battle's approaching its end game now, uh, and A Company, I think, is uh, moving towards the, the final ridge line. What was, the, what was the plan as it approached its end game? Well, if I can take it from the bow, really, because we, we pushed through B Company and we sort of, we reorganised there at that time, we had a 2IC uh, uh, Captain Freer, who was taking control of the 0.5 Browning. He fired it back towards the Argentine, the one that was used on B Company. Mac French, Sergeant Mac French, Sergeant Phelan, were all working those guns. We sorted ourselves out. We calmed our soldiers down uh, in the bowl. We even actually had a cup of tea. And we sat there, I made a... In the midst of the... Yeah, the in, the midst, in the battle. Yeah, yeah we had a cup of tea. Paras, isn't it? Having a brew in Having the midst of the battle. Sat the boys down. It's gone all over us. Just g keep the guys calm. We were then told at that stage, look, get off your weapon, because B Company now, obviously they, they had problems getting through the rocks. A Company took the decision to take our weapon off, fill our pockets full of ammunition, so we could get through the rocks faster. So we could be nimble as a greyhound, push forward in small fire teams, fire manoeuvre, okay, and take out positions. So we had fixed our bayonets, we had put a radio, strapped our radios onto our bodies, filled our pockets full of ammunition, took sacks as well, extra grenades, and then we push forward. And Tony, from your perspective, as you're approaching the, the final objective, what are you seeing? Well, the, the, I remember the light coming up, and I was thinking, well, that's good. We could, we could probably locate, 
these bunkers a bit easier. Uh, and the, they had brought up extra artillery just before we attacked. I can remember that whistling in it. And uh, when we went over the little ridge and then started to move down, uh, the pockets of resistance was a lot lighter because I think a lot of them had legged it uh, than B Company, but we were able to work easier and clear positions with grenades and using the rifle. And we started to reorganise and check the area, and we had three prisoners we sent back, we found uh, in the bunkers, because when we cleared it on a reorganise, they cleared the positions. Uh, one bloke was just wandering around, completely sh shocked, in shell shock, or whatever you want to call it. And got to talk. What were they like, the Argentinians? You know, what, what, well, what yeah, sort the of two I, I dragged out as. Uh, we didn't know there was a bunker there. It was a large, like, poncho. There was kit everywhere. One of the uh, soldiers pulled the, the poncho back. We were greeted with these shivering wrecks. They had the pictures of their family and rosary beads. And we got them out, and they looked unfed, they looked unkept, they looked really uh, hadn't been looked after by their NCOs. Did you feel sorry for them? Yeah, a little bit, I suppose. I was just thinking, poor buggers, like, get them back to the soul major and get them out of the way. You know, for your war's over, <laughs> off you go. Uh, and Tam, as you, as you hit the objective, as you take that final objective and you can look over towards Wireless Ridge and Port Stanley, is there a sense that this, your part of this battle is over? Is it, is it, do you, does it almost feel ended? Uh, well, that was our mission. I believe it was the mission ended, but you also have in the back of your mind that something else is going to happen, and that was counter-attack. Because by that stage, we had used our own ammunition, we used the ammunition they had because some of it was compatible. Uh, we were getting low on water, as Tony just mentioned there. Uh, we couldn't get our rations forward. So we're now in a, pr a pretty vulnerable stage, but that's just a part of our routine. When you get to that stage, the next thing is you look counter-attack. But as far as I was concerned, my section, section commander, I felt that like we had done our bit. That was it finished. Was there a sense of relief? Uh, no, not, not immediately because one, uh, it wasn't really until two or three days later when there's a calming. There's a lull in the battle. Um, so uh, in actual fact, I mean the 14th of June, the Argentinians surrender. So a couple of days, and I know that you're being shelled uh, for another 24 hours, but the 14th of June, when the surrender comes through. John, that when you heard about the surrender, a sense of relief, a sense of uh, victory. Yeah, when the surrender came up, we, we were ready for the next stage, and the next stage was taking Stanley. So we'd already prepared for that. We would had orders for it. We, we'd re-ammoed. Um, B Company were actually the reserve company then for taking uh, Stanley out. But while A Company had pushed through, um, we, we had gone firm, obviously, and done what we always do, get a brew on. And we, we suffered a bit during that period, and that was actually one of the worst parts for me personally, um, after A Company had pushed through. So we, we still had a lot, a lot of grief to, to put up with um, prior to the Argentinian surrender. Uh, Mick, when the Argentinian surrender? Yeah, it felt a bit of relief. Um, a bit happy, but very sad, obviously, because, as John said, they had a lot of grief to deal with, the loss of our colleagues, etc. Um, I can remember we were told to take our helmets off and put our berries on. We, it's as, a famous picture, of course. Of course, it? it's, yes. And John also said we were all... Um, re-equipped for the attack on Stanley. I had uh, an SMG on my back, I had an SLR, okay, I had about three or four 66s, more grenades than I think I've ever seen before or since, and we were to, uh, ready to go, and then the, the, the command came up, and I can remember uh, distinctly watching two para, who were on our sister battalion on Wireless Ridge, and three para, and then it became what can only be described as a race. Who, can get who to was going first? to be the first ones into Stanley? Whoever was going to be the first into Stanley, um, they weren't going to have a green berry on. <laughs> that was for sure. And the two battalions literally raced down there. Okay, um, there's always arguments about who was first. Doesn't really matter. Um, but there was a sense of relief, and also in the back of our mind, obviously the grief of losing really, really good friends and colleagues, etc. Um, so the Battle for the Falklands, the 255 uh, British dead, obviously hundreds wounded. I think Argentinians are 700, uh, 700 dead and thousands wounded. For you guys on three para, 23 dead, which is an un a figure which is unprecedented. Today would just be simply unacceptable. But 23 dead in one battle uh, is an astonishing figure and 43 of your mates wounded. Uh, the question that many people ask then, Len, is was it worth it? Definitely. 
Definitely, there's, there's no question to it. And I'll challenge anybody that, uh, that would say anything different. Mick, you lost mates, was it worth it? Absolutely, you've only got to go back to the Falklands as I was very fortunate to do, thanks to Tam, and to see the appreciation of the people down there to know that it's worth it. It has to be, we're not politicians, we're soldiers. And for us, it was British soil, it's our soil, it's been invaded and we're gonna get it back. And we did. And what goes on after that has got nothing to do, to be honest with us, but I, along with Len, would challenge anyone to, if they said, oh, I don't think it was worth it. Well, go down and ask someone who lives in Port Stanley if it was, and you'll get a different answer. So was that 33 years uh, ago now, Tony? What, do, you, do you think back on that time? Do you look back on that time? Not a lot. This is the first time I've probably spoke about it, especially on, uh, in public. Why is that? I don't know. I just wanted to, I think I needed to get on with, because I, I left the army and got another job. Family were growing up and had other, I focused on other things, riding my motorbike and I learned to fly, got a pilot's <laughs> license. Well, I don't do it anymore, but did things like that. And you've got to move on and people handle it differently. But I can assure you that leading up to this, I've had a few uh, dreaming at night and of course it's brought it back a little bit, start thinking about it. But uh, I agree, it's, it was worth it. It's what, uh, the little thing I can say is that when we landed in Teal, we took Teal out and there was no Argentinians in Teal but one bloke in the manager's house and the sole major woke him up with a nine million in his head. And uh, I can remember knocking on one of the houses because it was pitch black at night and the, the, the lady came down, because she doesn't know who it is, they're in, live in the middle of nowhere, as you know. And uh, I said, I can't remember what I said, I said something like, well, like uh, British forces or something like that, there's nothing to worry about. And she opened the door. Well, her whole, you know, demeanour and just seeing, she couldn't believe it. She said, where have you come from? I said, well, we've walked from Port St. Carlos. And she said, Oh, and she cried. Yes, it was worth it, definitely. Len, I mean, we talk about the after effects uh, of battle. Did you suffer any, what we would now recognise as post-traumatic stress disorder? Do you have any of those issues? Um, yeah, 12 years ago I was uh, diagnosed with it. It took 20 odd years to come out. Um, yeah, dreams, etc., etc. Um, yeah. But it's important to recognise it. It is you are wounded physically, yeah. and you can see that. But you can still be wounded mentally. Oh God, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, it, it's, it just it can be little things which can just spark it off. Um, it can be someone telling you their opinion, which can spark it off. It can be just seeing something, you know, just something that on the TV, just watching a program about it, you know. So it, it's it, it's a big thing, and I'm. You know, the army now have got better in recognising it. At the time, it was soldier on, son, get on with it, like, you know. And, and you did. You, you didn't talk about it. We, when we got back, we didn't talk about it. You know, I had things to focus on. Anyway, I got back. My son was born on the 28th of July, my first son. So, um, and he's named after my best friend that was killed in Six Platoon. Um, so, you know, I had that to focus on, and that sort of took the sting out of things for a few months. And I think then you get back into battalion life, you get back with, you know, with your sarge and your, your corporals and all the rest of it, and suddenly you're, you're back into it. And those things don't matter anymore. Tam, uh, Len's not the only one to name a son after the battle, is he? No, he's not. Uh, my son, uh, Jonathan Longdon Noble, uh, he was a, obviously a Falcons baby. Uh, after the trip down. And you the, named him after Mount Longdon? We named him after Mount Longdon, yes. Uh, just so that name could carry forward into the future. Um, my son followed my footsteps. He joined the 3rd Battalion in the Parachute Regiment. He spent five years there, uh, but unfortunately had to leave. He was involved in a fatal car accident and is now in sort of rehabilitation now. Uh, I take care of him now, but he also supports the Royal British Legion and helps those who have just come out of the Afghanistan war to put themselves back on track. I mean, it's, it's interesting that you went through that battle. You've all spoken about, uh, you know, the rounds coming in, dodging rounds, rounds coming in between your arms, and you survived it, and your son was in the Paris, but then life takes, sometimes just takes such a, a rotten turn. Yes, yes. I mean, how do you look back on your period in the military and your survival at Mount Longdon? Uh, I, was, I was, you know, I mean, I was trained by the best. 
Uh, I joined the parachute regiment from a start, from a recruit soldier. The motto is ready for anything, and that's, that's the way it was all the way through my career. Uh, finishing off 30 years, working through all the ranks to regimental sergeant major, uh, and then going commissioned for six years within the battalion. Uh, had a fantastic life. They trained me to do what I had to do, and that's what we've done in the Falklands. We followed the order out from Maggie Thatcher to go and defend the Falklands, and we've done that well. She sent the best. Simple as that. John, are you proud of what you did? Absolutely, absolutely. And the, the Falklands was probably the icing on the cake um, in, in our time. But we believed then, as we still believe, that we are the best regiment in the world. We, we certainly are the best in the British Army. What has went before, we're a very young regiment, but the history that we tried to follow places like Arnhem was a hard act to follow. Um, we believe we've done our bit, and the guys now who have done subsequent battles in Afghanistan and Iraq are exactly the same. They're exactly the same. So yeah, I'm, I'm immensely proud of my time in the Parachute Regiment. I'm immensely proud of what we've done on, on Mount Longdon, and the bonds that, that we for, formed within our time in the Army I think it's fair to say we're strengthened by what we all went through on Mount Longdon together and those bonds are as strong today as they were back then.